have um, Bob Hawk Award winners in and around our region in the Central Tablelands. And that was the inspiration um, for this series of talks. I'm Liz Davis, the Regional Ag Land Care Facilitator for the Central Tablelands, and I'm joined today with, by um, Claudia Weiss from Watershed Land Care as our Regional Land Care Coordinator, and of course, Charlie Arnott. To begin with, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize the traditional custodians and owners of the land that we all meet on here today, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. I'm on Miradjuri country, and in their words, Nanana Yindamara, Yuarli Nerimbangu, to acknowledge, care for, look after, and respect country. Now, a few um, housekeeping rules before I hand over to Charlie. This is being recorded, so by you staying on, you're um, allowing to be part of the recording. Charlie's presentation should go about 40-ish um, minutes, and we'll have time for questions afterwards. This is being recorded, so I will send it out to everybody that is registered for the recording. Um, it's a thrill to um, introduce Charlie Arnott. Um, Charlie was the winner of the Bob Hawkland Clear Award winner in 2018, I believe, Charlie? That's right, that's right, Liz, yep. And from there, I don't think he has stopped. I'll hand over to you, Charlie, <laughs> thanks for joining us. Awesome. Um, thanks, girls. Really appreciate um, you thinking that it was a good idea to have me on today. Um, and thrilled and, and, and very grateful that uh, those who have joined us have bothered, you know, not bothered, but I think that's a good use of their time. Um, so, and then the topic being, um, you know, land care, you know, is it more, I guess I turn it into a bit of a question, is it more than planting trees? Um, I guess we'll get to answering that question shortly. Um, I'll just flick to the next slide. It might just take me a minute to get, get the hang of this fancy technology I'm now using. Um, so that is this, just on the on the Bob Hawke Award, which I, I did win in 2018. Um, it was interesting because I actually seemed to have it for about three years because of um, the, the 2020 uh, Landcare Awards were not on due to COVID, of course, and... Um, uh, so I guess in some ways, um, and Andrew Stewart, who was the, I guess he was officially the 2020 um, recipient. Uh, he may have only had that for, for, for that, 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 um, that for a year um, uh, from a practical point of view. And then, um, of course, um, Bruce Maynard is the current uh, Bob Hawke National Land Care Award uh, recipient. I have to say, it was such a surprise to get that um, and very, very grateful to um, the person who nominated me and those, I'm not even sure what the process was to, um, to sort of be included in there. Um, it was um, the two others that were, were sort of, I guess, the finalists were, I, in my view, far more um, worthy recipients. Um, I didn't, I turned up to the ceremony in, in, um, in Brisbane in 2018, no acceptance speech, just going, this is a shoe in for someone else. It was a lovely night. Um, anyway, um, really pleased to um, have, yeah, have, have, have won that award. Um, and it's been a very, it's, it's been a very, it's been definitely, it's been probably the biggest um, springboard for, for what I've been doing up to this point um, in terms of, you know, opening some doors and 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 sort of um, being able to advocate for the sort of farming practices that um, we practice here, and not just the farming practices. I guess is is more than just practice in the paddock. As more importantly, and we'll get to that later in the in the show, um, it's as much about the philosophy and the attitude and the thinking that one might have um, in their farm and their farm is so much more than just a farm that has sheep and cattle and trees and soil and so on. It's often the place where we, um, we live. Um, it's a sanctuary. It's a, um, it's a place to, um, welcome people to, and it's a, a absolute, you know, responsibility to steward that landscape as well. Um, moving right along. So land care, more than just trees, um, I don't think so. Land care to me is two two other things. Um, it used to be just about trees when 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 we started our land care journey uh, back in 1989 um, with the Borough Community Land Care Group. But now it's certainly much more. And I am just going to 
um, invite people to drop in the chat box, the chat room, the chat section, what they think land care might be. I, I have I, I have two things. So if you can guess if, if you can guess those two things that I think land care is really about, then I don't know. The girls might have some amazing prize for you. Um, I just just drop that on them now. Um, so my journey, where did it start? It started at Burua, and this is and, it, and this is where the journey is continuing. That's where I am right now. Um, I hope everyone knows where Burua is. It's it's nearly the centre of the world, um, as the, the way I see it. We started. Mum and Dad got here in 1970. Um, very conventional mixed farming enterprise, um, and uh, Burua is spelled incorrectly there. I'm sorry. Um, and as a kid, I loved it. It was it was my playground. It was where I grew up. It's you know lemonade in the paddock with mates with those beautiful short on cows in the background. Um, it's family again. It's a sanctuary. But for me, it was a place of fun. You know, and nature was my playground. I had no idea. Well, I didn't really think much about how nature and that landscape was going to inform the rest of my life and how it was a very um, critical partner in what we currently do now. Um, so when I say conventional, we did um, we had lots of inputs, lots of output. Um, we were cropping. You see there some uh, beautiful um, crop of oats. We, we had lambs. We had, you know, mutton. We had wool. We had, you know, trade cattle. We had breeding cattle. We had canola, wheat, loosen, everything you could think of we were doing here, which is not unlike a typical farm here at Burua. You know, we had our good years and we had our bad years. We made good decisions, we made bad decisions like any farm. Um, and that picture on the top left there is something that I think about quite often. It was a um, pretty tough time. We were you know, doing some fencing and I was, I'm, I'm glad I took that snapshot because that's my benchmark for never, ever looking like that ever again. Uh, and we haven't um, pretty much since then. And that one below is the Lucent Paddock, which is, again, a, a sort of an indicator of... Um, you know, how we thought, you know, we, we wanted to have very clean, loose and pasture. So what do we do? We sprayed everything else out. Um, uh, and because we wanted to be able to, you know, sell and, and use very clean loose. But my, my paradigm around um, that in particular um, changed significantly, you know, some, some years later. So where, where does Landcare fit into that? We joined as a, as a group in 1989, the Borough Community Landcare Group, our family, um, uh, which I think Borough might have been the second Landcare Group after one in Victoria that um, was created um, back when Landcare, you know, was, was born in 1989. Um, I went away to school and did other things and um, worked in a pub in Sydney, went to university, did other things and I came back and I think it was only minutes for those who know David Marsh um, uh, you probably laugh it was only I was only here for minutes um, before David approached me and said would you like to join the land care group um, I turned up and, and I walked out as a secretary not really knowing what the hell I was doing um, and I stayed in the Borough Community Land Care group for I think I was working out the other day until 2010 or 11 so what's that 24 is that 24 years no is that right? No, that's not. That could be that long. Um, yeah, fourteen years. Fourteen years might be more like it. Um, until I sort of officially resigned from the committee. Um, now, what? Oh, I might have. Had, I might have the wrong presentation here. I think. Just quietly, um, we'll work. We'll work with it. It's fine. Um, oh, hang on. What I might do? Can I just 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 stop things for a minute, there, Liz? Yeah, no problems at all, Charlie. Yeah, is that cool? Because what I'm going to yeah. do, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and just make sure I've actually got the right one. Because I've got a feeling that I don't. Um, you know, what, what, so what did that mean? What was farming to me back then? You know, I'd been to university, I did rural science, it was four years of hard hardcore, hardcore science. But interestingly enough, and I didn't really realise this until later, that you know, a lot of the science, a lot of the, the subjects, you know, we did, you know, for example, soil biology, chemistry and physics, okay? Very, you know, pretty intense sort of um, topics, um, but not once did they bring that together as, as a soil kind of... Um, uh, just lost you, Charlie.
Has anybody else lost Charlie? Liz, I've lost him as well. Okay. He's just frozen, so we'll just give him a minute and see what's happening. Yeah, it's frozen for me too, Liz. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Tim. So, Claudia, do you have any of those comments in chat? Because I'm unable to see those. If you want to share those with people right now, and I'll just... Um, Sure. Um, so more importantly, Liz has a I Love Farmers apron up for grabs. Um, so Maddie um, has shared ensuring the integrity of our environment for future generations. Uh, Durant, Durrani, um, Landcare and Ethos and Community of Practice, a place to do farm and nature things with other locals. Um, and she's a past member of Belgravia Landcare and, and a Central Tablelands Landcare member. Um, Megan has shared allowing ecosystem balance, embracing all living things and being willing to learn your place within that ecosystem. So some great um, views there and other what Landcare means to people that are on the call today. So we've just... I'm not sure where Charlie has disappeared full stop there, Liz. I sent them an email to let them know that they're frozen. He might just be um, giving his presentation and not be aware that he's frozen. Okay. I'm just going to stop our recording, Liz. Sure. Again, my apologies, everyone. Got it. Okay, so where were we? I think I was saying, um, yeah, it was a bit of a struggle. It, it's really started to be quite a struggle, if you can see my screen there. Can you see my screen? Everyone? Yes, that's all good. Awesome. Um, so what did that, that's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? What that what was it, what did that look like? You know, after some years of um, of questioning my um, uh, questioning my behaviors and my activities, and what was evident was my my behavior was not congruent with my values. I did, wasn't even sure what my values were, but it, there was a real sort of set of tension events on the horizon for me that were playing on my mind they were playing out in the paddock um, and it really got to a point where um, I knew I needed to change things and, and a significant moment was in in Burrawa, um, a day-long course called profiting from the drought um, which I thought was a bit of a joke being called profiting from a how did you profit from a drought and the facilitator there was put on by RCS Australia and the facilitator said to me um at lunchtime, we're going down the road to get a pie. And he said, you know, he'd been at us all morning. And he said, are you, are you happy? And I said, well, I'm not unhappy. Um, and that was a pretty shit answer, I thought. Um, and so that was the beginning of, a, a, dare I say, a journey and, 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 and paradigms being broken. So there's profiting from the drought is a, is a week-long course. My overseer is currently doing day two of that at Tamworth as we speak. Um, that course changed my life. Um, and I know that RCS have been um, here at Burrower a number of times doing different courses um, uh, brought here by Landcare. And um, I, you know, I don't earn anything. There's no commission for me saying this. You know, they've, they've been an amazing organisation that has steered me, in, you know, dare I say, in my current direction. So what happened to me in that time? You know, I was changing paradigms. I was changing my beliefs. Um, all the time in the background, I had a notion that land care was about growing trees because that's pretty much all we'd done to that point. We put up a few fences, we'd grown some trees, uh, and that was what land care represented to me. Um, Salt Shake was an amazing program that Bureau of Community Land Care Group started. It was an award-winning program um, back in 1996, I think it started, and that went for three or four years. Um, so what happened? You know, a paradigm is a typical example, a pattern of something, a pattern, you know, in this case, a pattern of thinking. And so my thinking was um, uh, very different to what it is now. And it's not right or wrong. It's just very different. So, you know, what did that, what did that do for me? It started me, started me down a different track. Um, in terms of the development of my thinking around land care, you know, this was going hand in hand. This is a beautiful thing. Land care was kind of a bit of a framework for environmental stewardship from day one, from when I got back home and when I was involved in that land care group as a secretary in 1997. And so, you know, I was already in environment mode, you know. Yes, we're putting in trees and that's a really important um, step, absolutely. But, you know, is anyone put in the chat, um, did anyone put in the chat, um, there, what they thought land care was. I'll give you a minute or 30 seconds. Two things to me are the most important thing about land care. 
Um, well, there you go. For me, it's people and soil. Everything else on a farm, in a community, a rural community. Um, I mean, okay, let's extend it beyond rural community. In, in the world, depends on the people in it and the soil on which they stand. Because it's that soil that um, grows the food. It's the soil that um, supports the um, number of landscape functions, which we'll get to. And it's the soil that is um, the beginning and the end of everything on earth, essentially. So that's my answer. Um, it's not the end of the presentation, but that's that's in, that's in a nutshell, people and soil. So this is a great quote from Wendell Berry. The soil is a great connector of lives. The source and destination of all it is the healer and restorer and resurrector by which disease passes into health, age into youth, death into life. Without proper care for it, we can have no community because without proper care for it, we can have no life. Um, you know, I had to put a cow down this morning and... Um, as we do here, we you know we 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 revere life and um, and are responsible for death sometimes. And what I the little chat I had to her had had with her, you know, in her uh, last moments was that you know appreciation for what she'd done for us and that she will be returning to the soil. Now she's in a part of Hannah, you know, we're not, we're not going to get a tractor, and, and so I know she's going to sit there and literally become part of the soil. And you know, I guess that's a, a bit of a short story but it's really highlights um, some of the things that we do and and i advocate others to do you know it's not just about practice it's about it's as much about your thinking uh, it's as much about your attitude and as much about your reverence for the animals in your environment um, and how do those animals become healthy or not you know they um uh it's all all comes back it all comes back to that soil now some of the things that you know, are all soil related that I, I often refer to. And this is kind of a bit of a, um, a list put together by Gabe Brown. Some of you probably heard of Gabe Brown. I know of his um, activities in the United States. Um, Dirt to Soil is his fantastic book. And he puts it this way, um, regenerative ag and I'm, I'm mentioning regenerative agriculture, called sustainable agriculture. It's, it's, it's an all-encompassing um, umbrella. And for those who don't like that word regenerative, that's absolutely fine too. Just think of it as sustainable or con conservation agriculture um, or just working with nature. You know, that's it. I'm not, I don't have any hard and fast rules around regenerative agriculture. Um, I do say that it's, it's all about the quality. And, you know, if you're, if you're building the quality and quantity of your soil, that's pretty much what you're doing. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the aims of all, all, all farmers should be, I, I believe. So no disturbance, um, or very, very minimum, um, increasing the soil's defence, so the outer layers are protecting it. So he calls it the, the, a body of armour, so grass, um, vegetation, biodiversity, you know, keeping that um, the biodiversity pumping. And again, the landscape functions um, uh, uh, maintain and enhance um, the biodiversity of any environment. Um, and that includes us too, by the way, like we are part of the biodiversity of any environment, the human element. Um, keeping roots living in the ground, you know, so I'm not a big fan of um, summer fallows. We used to do a lot of that um, here. Um, and I now understand that that's, you know, in my, in my, my world, not, not something we, we'd ever do again. And I would advocate that. Um, an animal and insect integration, you know, there's nowhere in the planet where animals don't exist in harmony. Well, you know, at least don't exist uh, um, uh, outside of, you know, without vegetation. You know, we, ha we can't have environments without that animal um, life and death cycle, fertility cycle, disturbance cycle. Um, moving on, conscious of time. The other bit, so that's the soil part of land care. The other bit that I think, and everything again stems from this, stems from the soil and the people, is the people. People matter most. Um, some of you might recognise Stuart Andrews there. Um, uh, and <laughs> Stu McWilliam, he, has got a, he hasn't got a shirt on. It looks like he's got a shirt on, but he hasn't. That's his, that's his tattoos. We were there doing some um, natural seconds farming contouring. But people are, um, without doubt, um, I would, I would, yeah, with soil, the most important um, thing, because we are, we have a responsibility to maintain and and regenerate that soil, and and landscapes can't function whether we like it or not. Pulling people out of landscape is not going to be helpful, in my view. So what is what is what is what is um, people? You know, how do we split people up? Well, I say it's self, it's family and community, and obviously, you know, I believe and firm believer in, you know, 
you've got to put your own oxygen mask on first before um, you can help others. And so I always start with self. What does that look like here? Well, it looks like being landscape literate, and that's been able to understand and at least appreciate and observe the five landscape functions. And some of you might um, know a reference this from Charlie Massey uh, called The Reed Warbler, his amazing, um, uh, amazing book. Um, so solar function, water cycle, soil and mineral cycle, and a dynamic ecosystem and communities. Um, and, and, this, and the human and the social overlay of that. So again, we're talking about the human, that number five is a human community element. Um, the other four, that all happens within the soil, doesn't it? You know, sun brings life, um, uh, moisture brings life to soil, and it's soil that where it all happens, you know. Plants need soil, but soil make plants, you know. It, it, sorry. Um, uh, plants, plant, you actually need plant life in soil to grow, to grow soil. And that's where getting back to that um, summer fallow situation. Um, I just think it's a real fallacy that, um, you know, keeping paddocks bare over summer is going to retain moisture. There's a lot of science now. Um, and um, uh, Christine Jones, if any, I'm sure some of you would have heard of Christine Jones. She's done a lot of work and um, research around this. There's actually more moisture left in the in, in, in the in the in a paddock at the end of the season after a, after a multi-species pasture crop has been put in as as opposed to bare summer fallow. You've got biology that's keeping that soil literally alive, and then um, when you do put your winter crop in, you can have at least you're sowing into an environment that's alive, not a, not not just sort of like a a substrate so that you know you can plant crops into, which just happens a lot, and we used to do that. Um, Moving right along, I'm looking at the, um, uh, you know, grazing is one of the practices that, um, again, and I'm pretty, sort of putting this all into the self category. This is a sort of the understanding I believe is important and not critical, but I mean, I think, you know, there's not many land care people I've met that don't kind of look at these things at least and appreciate and understand, you know, the, the, um, uh, the grazing principles. Um, I won't go bang on through them. They're right there in front of you. But it's all about managing your stock. It's about the husbandry. It's about um, how you use them as a tool. Um, it's about how you actually fence them in, you know, large and large numbers in small areas for short periods of time is the way that you can sort of generally put that together. That's a really important thing. Um, you know, what else did I learn about myself or what else did I kind of develop, you know, once I changed my paradigms and I started looking at things very differently? You know, I love my grass more than my livestock. You know, some people go, well, that's, you're being mean to your livestock. No. Um, what I mean by that is that, you know, I have to, you know, keep my grass growing. I have to make sure I've got enough of it and, and look after it. Um, and if I'm doing that, then I'll be selling livestock um, before um, uh, before others, uh, hopefully, and also selling before I need to or, or, you know, in a panic sort of a sell situation and before they lose condition. So... Um, and the other one I love, and again, you know, and this applies, I guess I'm going through some of these points because I believe if one can kind of potentially you know, have, this, have some of these attitudes or have some of these maxims or mantras in their lives, then they are going to be much more, um, uh, they're going to contribute a lot more to community at the end of the day. 80% um, of something is better than 100% of nothing. You know, the, the um, perfection, um, Perfection is the enemy of progress. And, you know, we, we in our biodynamic workshops, we always say, you know, don't get caught up in all of the, the do's and the don'ts and so on. Just go out and do things and start things. You know, a, a wrong decision is better than no decision at all. Um, there's someone waiting in the, in, the, in the waiting room there, I think. Yeah, David. Um, a few other things that sort of really um, were... Uh, um, critical in the way you know changing what I was thinking is you know we were we were commodity farmers back then when we did um, wheat and canola and hay and all those sort of things we just grew something to sell it now you know in terms of like thinking you know how do I change myself and how can I then contribute to the world we grow food you know that's what we do um, also you know we were we were we we were involved very closely with the prescriptive agriculture relying on agronomists to tell us what to do and how to do it and lots of chemical input. Um, now we engage in enabling agriculture, we enable nature and, and all the landscape functions to help us do a better job and create better products. 
And there's also the, the, the adaption versus adoption sort of paradigm. You know, there were things that we um, used to adopt, adopt the advice of, um, ag um, of agronomists. Now it's about adapting, you know, recipes to suit what we did. A great example of that was some years ago, um, Landcare helped me um, convert an old uh, combine to uh, one that could handle trash and do a much better job. You know, that was an example of adaption. We just did, didn't go just go and buy something new. Um, we adapt principles to, um, to what we do. And just shifting into a bit of human stuff here, um, which I'll relate back to Lanky in a second, you know, we also look at and are much more observant of the root causes of things. This is this particular example you see in front of you is relating more to humans, but it's very, you know, it's exactly the same for, for plants. You know, if we've got rust, if we've got rusty notes, getting back to that example before, We've got to ask the question why, before you go and spray it with a fungicide, you've got to ask the question why. Why is, why is a rust, which is a fungus, has come out of the ground and it's in, in basically living on and um, uh, being, a, being a nuisance to oats? Well, there's, to me, it always comes back to what's the root cause? It's something in the soil, you know, and it's the same with human health. And talking about human health, you know, one of the, one of the and putting that in the context of people and Bora Community Land Care Group, one of the things we did um, back in the day, in the middle of the millennial drought, was we put on a movie, the big blob, big blob screen. Ratatouille was a movie, kids and family. You know that was not a responsibility of Landcare, but it was an initiative of Landcare to do something for the people, do something for the community. It was a fantastic. I remember it was Easter time because the kids were running around finding chocolate eggs all over the park. Um, and so, and, and and some other initiatives of the Borough Community Landcare Group has been some resilience. Um, focusing on resilience um, workshops. And there's one that's coming up on the 22nd of, of March. Um, and Alan Parker, who's a world-renowned expert in um, negotiation and human behaviour. Now, that's, it might seem, a fair divergence from growing trees. And it is, you know. But what Landcare, and in this case, Bora Community Landcare Group are doing, is giving people the opportunity to um, better, dare I say, better themselves by understanding human behaviour um, and specifically or some you know, negotiation because we negotiate with ourselves, don't we? You know, it's not just negotiating with your, your agent or your family member or your, someone, you know, it's um, often negotiate with ourselves. And so there's a, another example that, you know, land care is so much more than, um, than growing trees. Um, so mental health is a big thing um, that land care has contributed to. Getting back to self and attitude, you know, um, I used to probably, you know, I think, I was a bit more of the person on the left, having a big ego, you know, controlling nature. Um, really, it's about being part of that cycle um, and contributing in a positive way. Um, that's my father there. He, you know, amazing man, um, somewhat of a mentor to me. Um, in his paradigms, like you are not what you do. We're all sitting here. Some of you are farmers. Some of you are not. Some of you, are whatever you're doing. Um, you know, I try and remove myself from, from and, and not pigeonhole myself into um, I'm a farmer. Yes, I'm a farmer, but I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm a, so many other different things. And, you know, sort of keeping colour in my life is really important. Um, consider nature as your most valuable business partner. I think that's really important. That's something that's changed a lot of things we do here. That's something I didn't think of. Nature was a resource to be used. Um, and you know, changing our focus from controlling nature to controlling our economics, I think it's a pretty important thing as well. Um, I just threw this in because it's a picture of my daughter holding some compost we make. Um, Earth turns the gold in the hands of the wise. Again, putting them back to the human element, the self, you know, the soil um, is so similar in the makeup and the biome uh, as, as the gut, the human gut. It's fascinating. If you see it on a microscope, it looks very, very similar. Um, you know, here we do, we sell direct to butchers. So we sell a sizzle, not just the sausage. It's about the story. Every single one of you on this call has a story to tell, whether you're in or out of agriculture directly or not. You know, you have wonderful stories and wonderful offerings to the world, um, even if you're not selling a product. Um, and responsibility is two words. You know, it's, it's, it's our ability to respond. Um, and I think as land care groups um, and communities, we have somewhat of a responsibility um, to respond to climatic change, to the needs of the community and the needs of the individual. Um, so what does that look like? Well, how, what do we do here? Well, we do plant trees still. Um, they used to be canola, you know, 
high, high input chemical um, situation, that very same place is now um, growing many, many trees. We use biodynamics. That involves you know, lots of people coming on, um, on site here and doing workshops. Um, there's a great little picture. I love this one of, um, again, planting trees. So yes, planting trees are still part of land care. That's what it used to look like back in about 2001. That was probably 10 years later. Um, uh, cattle, we use cattle, we have sheep, we have pigs, you know, we integrate different animals and it's a very biodiverse situation. And here we go, we're planting trees again um, with my family, you know, so this introduces this again, another part of that people aspect of, of your own family. We often rely on, we'll rely on them to plant trees. Um, uh, and also just on that one, I mean, this might be a little bit controversial, but um, in terms of planting trees, I am a big fan, I have to say, of exotic species. And I understand that that doesn't suit some people and that's fine. I'm not here to argue or sort of, you know, say it was right or wrong. But, you know, in the words of uh, or the phrase of Peter Andrews of Natural Seconds Farming fame, there is a lot of, you know, we've wounded the landscape. Um, we have incised it literally with um, gullies um, from mismanagement over many years, over many generations. And, you know, that landscape, I believe, needs to be put in intensive care. Now, what do you do with a person who goes in intensive care? You throw everything you can at it. Um, and in this case, in the, it's from a landscape point of view, I think, you know, we have the, the, the option, the ability to um, help heal that landscape with other species that probably were here some time ago uh, and may not be here. There's plenty of species that Hanamino are here and I see around the district that are not uh, endemic to the Boora region or to even to Australia, but I can see them repairing the landscapes like a suture. You know, I know um, a lot of money was spent on the Boora River many years ago, and I was actually part of it, you know, um, uh, removing willows from the Boora River. Um, now, as I, my understanding of hydrology improved, um, I realised that was probably a terrible thing to do um, because that river has, I, I, I think some would argue that river is actually uh, less stable than it used to be because those willows were actually like sutures on that landscape, on that wound. Um, again, that might throw a few people out, but I think, you know, species like oaks and ash who are, you know, um, incredibly resilient, um, are what I would encourage, you know, we certainly do here, you know, because they have deep tap roots, they're great nutrient cycles, they give much more shade than a gum, same size, same volume, much more shade. Um, I think their value is is um, is is immense, um, and you know, I mean, if it's about sort of only having natives in the landscape um, from a vegetation point of view, well, we should we should probably consider taking out the non-native animals, you know, sheep and cattle. I mean, if you want to go all the way down the track of of you know native versus exotic, then perhaps you know us whiteies should probably leave as well, you know. So. Um, I don't think we need to do that. I think there's lots of lots of healing that can be done socially and culturally and, and environmentally. And and um, again, back to the trees, the exotic species that um, we have that option to use. Um, this is a bit of a summary. Um, ask better questions. Um, focus on what you you own control of. Um, Eighty percent of something is better than one hundred percent nothing. It's come up again. Don't say no. Say oh. Often with our biodynamic workshops, you know, some pretty crazy stuff we talk about. Um, and <laughs> we just say to people so they don't freak out, you know, don't dismiss things. Don't necessarily say no, just say, oh, just sort of see, see how that might fit into your world. Um, problems are, are the results of unmet, unmet needs. Um, you know, again, talking about the self and family and community, you know, often men especially, we're so good at sort of looking at a problem and going, we've got a solution. But if you start to ask better questions and you actually dig down to the root cause of things, and that's always about unmet needs. You know, whether it's the unmet needs of a, of a landscape, the unmet needs of an individual or a family or a community, they're the questions that I think, you know, we, we, we need to be really clear on asking is, uh, you can ask them directly or just sit and reflect and go, what needs are not getting met here? that might actually be causing this problem. And if you can go that far, if you can get into that uh, and have that understanding, then um, you are much more likely to solve that problem than just going, right, problem, here's a solution, throw money at it, whatever it might be. A um, couple other quick ones here. Success is the confluence of preparation opportunity. Um, I love that one. 
you know, or you could put luck there is the confluence of preparation opportunity. And I know, you know, if you are prepared for anything, whether it's preparing for the next drought, because there will be one, uh, or the next big rainfall event, or, or the next tree planting, you know, um, then, you know, then you, when the opportunity presents itself, you'll be ready to go. And it's, in farming, I think it's a really underrated kind of way of looking at things. Um, and also just getting back to um, focusing on what you're in control of. You know, I used, to control, I used to focus on the weather a lot. Um, I probably shouldn't have because I couldn't change that, you know, but what I could focus on is when it did rain, what, what, what more am I going to do with that rain? And, and our, our practice, or not our practice yet, but our looking into and starting contouring and natural sequence farming sort of um, management and practice is um, preparing for the opportunity of rain when it falls. Uh, and one last one, only compare yourself to your former self, I think that's important. You know, I don't pay out on conventional farmers. I used to be one, I'm not that anymore. Um, I'm just here and you know, I guess one of the things about the Bob Hawke Award and, and what that meant for me was an opportunity to at least tell people what we do, not say it's right or wrong, but just say what's working and often what's not working as well. Because, you know, I'm not perfect. What we do here is, is far from perfect, but um, we're happy to share. And I think that's really important. And that's one thing. Another good thing about land care is the, the, the way they share, you know, in, with community, um, the getting people into places like the Burrex Services Club to listen to Alan Parker in a couple of weeks' time and talk about human behaviour. I mean, that is a really important thing and it's, it's, it's pretty far away from trees. That's nearly a, nearly a wrap, really. That's some contact information. Um, we have a podcast called The Regenerative Journey. David Marsh um, is interviewed that in season one. There's probably a few others that you may um, uh, may have heard of in there, um, international and, and, and local um, and national and um, or on Instagram but, um, and LinkedIn. And that's pretty much pretty much it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, appreciate that, you know, um, You've got through our internet issues here. It sounds, looks like we've, we've stayed, the, stayed the course. And we've probably got a few minutes for some questions too. Oh, well done, Charlie. That was amazing. Really enjoyable. And I love how you touched on all the facets of land care. I think that's so important to um, explaining land care to people, isn't it? They don't really get a huge people component of, um, well, especially out in the rural communities and what that means to, to all of those communities. We do have a question from me and Holcroft in regard to exotic trees, example, oaks and ash. Are there any of these that can't be planted with sheep, repoisoning via them eating the leaves on the ground? Great question. No, look, I, I, I have heard of um, uh, with oaks, sometimes the acorns and er, ergot, ergot, I think, but I, I, I've never experienced that. Um, uh, I guess, look, Animals can be poisoned on anything if they eat enough of it. And I think in a, in a biodiverse environment where you might have oaks and, and ash and, you know, gums and shrubs and all sorts of things, then I think, you know, the chance of that sort of a thing is pretty slim. Um, I mean, they are also very nutritious. The leaves of, of both those species and, you know, honey locust and elm and, I mean, there's just so many. We, we, I mean, trees like Karajong, obviously natives, they're amazing. Um, uh, in themselves, there's not probably not a, not enough of them in the world, I don't think. Um, but you know, um, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be hesitant to to put them in um, you know in, where you're in an environment where there's lots of other different things to um, um, to for them to eat. I mean, there's also yeah, uh, I guess that there are there are medicinal kind of one would argue that there are different level of nutrition that 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 animals you know sheep and cattle um who are eating native pasture and introduced pasture and native trees and shrubs and things or browsing when they can um, and they do because that's that's you know the tannins and so on in wattle seeds and a lot of the leaves of gums and so on um have a you know um uh, an impact on worm on worms in the gut so you know um you know, potentially um, things like ash and oak and elm uh, have a different nutrient profile than what they would normally um, uh, get from natives as well, native grass and trees. And so that's probably a good thing too. It may just help them um, cover a little bit of a nutrient gap that may be if they were just on a totally native kind of a diet. 
And Megan, I'll also follow that up with our vets and just double check there with regards to any health issues that they're aware of. Um, but um, yeah, there's another one here with regards to exotic trees. If you had success with in stabilizing, um, sorry, what exotic trees have you had success with in stabilizing wet sodden gullies? Or do you have suggestions for high rainfall areas with high altitude? Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you repeat that, Liz? Yeah. What exotic trees have you had success with in stabilizing wet sodden gullies? Or do you have suggestions for high rainfall areas with high altitude, Hampton near O'Brien? Oberon, sorry. Uh, well, Oberon, I think, would be um, perfect for elms and oaks and any 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 sort of those European and even North American sort of species. Um, I'd steer away from things like, well, maybe Oberon's a little different, but things like birch don't do well here. They just get cooked in the summer and, and maple and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of gullies, that's a really good question. We haven't done a lot of exotic tree planting in gullies. Um, and because a lot of our gullies, we, we had funding and we just, you know, fenced them off and put natives and direct seeded and hand planted anyway. So um, there are some exotics in some of them, but, you know, we've sort of, I guess, um, uh, when we're planting exotics, we tend to put them more higher in the landscape. And it is my understanding of natural sequence farming and fertility flow, um, you know, develops, um, you know, Stuart Andrews would, would, you know, he has those three sort of zones of, you know, landscape. You've got, your, you've got your fertility zone on the tops of the hills, you've got your production zone in the middle, and then you've got your wetland sort of accumulation zone at the bottom. And he would argue that you don't put trees in the, the bottom of the landscape. So he would argue that you, you wouldn't put a whole lot of trees like a, a burrow mix, which is all sorts of different, you know, eucalypts and so on, and wattles in and around a gully for stabilisation. You'd be better off trying to put some wetland species in there. You know, whether that's smaller shrubs, whether that's kombungi and, and phragmites, phragmites, that's going to do you much better um, good um, in terms of hydrology than um, uh, than putting gums in. So we've kind of taken that on board, and we're putting our things higher up in the landscape because as that you know, it's gravity is your friend in this situation. Where there's, there's fertility and especially exotics with leaves that you know fall every autumn. Um, if they're higher in the landscape, then they're going to be spreading that fertility theoretically down that hill. If it's already at the, it's already in the gully, um, there's nowhere for it to go, but probably off your paddock, off your property onto someone else's place. Does anybody else have any other questions? Carly? Jen Ringbauer, you've surely got a question for me. And Jen was a bit late coming in. <laughs> I missed the whole presentation. Oh, how rude. <laughs> we we'll get a recording to everybody. Um, that won't be a problem once we've got it up on the YouTube channel. I'll send that link through along with a survey for your feedback. This is the last of this series, but we're really hoping on working on something in the future. So your feedback, suggestions, ideas would be really, really welcome. Um, I think it's a great way of um, sharing a lot of different and diverse opinions and ways of uh, farming methods. And I think we can learn a lot without having to come face to face um, and have these conversations. Makes it a little bit easier. It's one thing that I've certainly got from COVID is that we've got this ability to um, have these sessions. And if you can't make it on the day, you can watch it some other time. Um, Charlie, any last comments from you? Oh, I just want to thank you for putting this series together because for some years I've been thinking about, um, uh, you know, the the previous and, and 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 current and you know since I um, won the award, you know those those um, recipients. There's a really interesting bunch of people there, and you know I've often thought, wouldn't it be lovely to kind of bring them all together and, on a project, you know, with their right. network and their their um. Uh, their thinking and, the, and 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 so on and um, I never got around to do it. It's one more thing that you know. Think what a lovely thing to do. What does that look like? How do you how do you manage that? Um, but what you've managed to do is at least get um, three, I believe. Um, Cole, was it Cole Sice and and yeah. um, 
uh, and brewers um, in you know in a series. And look, that's probably the next best thing. So good on you guys for um, for pulling that together. And look, maybe one day we'll all work, you know if someone thinks that's a good idea, we could all work on something which would be good to promote the Bob Walker Award and land care generally anyway. Um, and um, uh, look, I'll, I'll leave that for someone else to organise. I think, but um, that'd be that'd I be think lovely. It sounds like a perfect opportunity. I'm just starting to look at a five year program, so we'll see what we can um, come up with. Because <laughs> there's some members, um, um, Andrew Stewart down there in Victoria, who was um, a two, two, 2020 or 21 yeah, um, right. recipient. I mean, he's 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 lovely, lovely guy, and so many amazing things um, happening down there. Yan Yan Gert, uh, their family farm. Um, near Colac, or um, uh, so, and, and then previous ones, there's, there's, there's quite a few of them. So, you know, I'll leave it to someone. Okay. It's been lovely to, to, to spend the, the last hour or so uh, with you all. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for registering for this series. And I will be in touch. Thanks to Central Tablelands Regional Land Care Network um, for being willing to um, collaborate with me on this program. Well done, everybody, and thank you. Thank you.